Hey, what's up you guys? It's Ruthie and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 50 of The Murder House by James Patterson and David Ellis. So let's get right into this video. This video may contain sensitive topics of foul language. If you do not wish to continue, I suggest you click off the video now. You have been warned. Chapter 50. Okay, here Ricketts removes a piece of paper from her file folder. Eight victims over the last decade, all unsolved. I know about the ones last summer of 2011. I say Zach and Melanie, Bonnie Stamos, my uncle. Let's start with the older ones before I came here. Good, she says. That's what I did. Dee Dee Paris, I say, reading the first name. Last seen May 9th, 2007. The first two go together, she says. Dee Dee Paris and Annie Church. Yale sophomores, May 9th, was the... When they left New Haven that summer, they lied to their friends and family about how they were spending their summer. They came here to the Hamptons. They were discovered later through cell phone records and then their car, which was ultimately found in Montauk after a lengthy search. She removes two photos from her file folder and hands them to me. Dee Dee is the blonde, Annie is the brunette. Dee Dee's photograph is from a volleyball game. She's tall and athletic with blonde hair cropped tight against her head. The photo of Annie is a school photo, probably from high school. A bright smile and warm eyes. Her hair parts her hair past her shoulders reddish brown so they were killed in montuk i ask ricketts shrugs nobody knows that's where their car was found their bodies were never found or should i say most of their bodies were never found i look at the document she typed organized and professional her finger i say reading the one line summary for dd yeah they found one of dd's fingers in the woods near montuk two years after they disappeared they were assumed foul play but didn't know it until somebody's dog found the finger then they got a DNA match. So they were killed in 2007, and a single finger was found in 2009. Two years, and nobody found it. Well, that's possible, sure, but tell me about the finger. I say, what? Was it decomposed? Was there anything distinctive about it? No, and yes. She opens her folder again and shows me a photograph of the finger. Not decomposed much at all. Well preserved with a ring on it. A class ring from Santa Monica High School, if I'm reading that right. Okay, I say, handing her back the photo. She slides it into the folder. So after that, we have the third one, Brittany Halstead. I say July 2008, prostitute, says Ricketts. She hands me another photo, a mugshot. Oh, she's young, not more than 18 or 19 in this photo. She is thin, blonde, attractive, but with a beat-up look about her the most working girls have. She used the name Barbie on the street, says Ricketts, last seen alive, getting on the back of a motorcycle outside a nightclub in Shirley. She told her friend she was going to be gone for the night, the whole night, smart of him. Nobody would be expecting her back. It would give the offender some time before anyone could... Anyone would be looking for her. Last seen alive, I say. So they found her. They found Brittany. She hands me another photograph. A couple of miles down Sunrise Highway from where she was picked up on the motorcycle. She's lying face down in a bed of leaves. Her head turned toward the camera. Her eyes shut. She has the, the ghostly mannequin look of a corpse dead for at least a couple of days. A pool of blood surrounds the lower half of her body. This photo doesn't show it, says Ricketts, but, she, but he carved her up. He disassembled disemboweled her the emmy thought he used a corkscrew oh god a corkscrew i say as if there was a nice way of dis disemboweling someone i look at the remainder of the sheet so then in 2010 we have sally feisfer then we move up to 2011 to melanie and zach bonnie stamos and my uncle that's interesting why is that interesting i look at ricketts who's watching me carefully she's a pup looking to learn a thing or two so i explain my thoughts we don't know if this is the same offender i say but it looks but if it is, look at the timing. He kills in 2007, then in 2008 he kills again, then he doesn't kill again until 2010 with Sally Feisfer. So what does that mean? He didn't do anything in 2009? Well, he did do something in 2009, I correct. He planted Dee Dee Paris's finger for us to find. Clearly, he pres preserved that finger would have been badly decomposed, and just in case we had trouble identifying it, he made sure her high school class ring was on it. He might as well have posted... A sign saying, look, everyone, this is Dee Dee's finger. He wanted us to know, she says. Why? Ricket sits quietly, her eyes moving around the room, her mental machinery fully in gear. He was struggling, I say. He didn't want to kill anybody else, but you know what else was bothering him? What? He wasn't getting any attention, I say. She draws back. Attention? You think he wants to get caught? Oh, no. This guy does not want to get caught. Quite the opposite. This guy gets off on the thrill of getting away with it of doing something so terrible and walking away scot-free. I'm sure the stories about Annie and Dee Dee were all over the South Shore papers in 2007. Two Yale undergrads gone missing. It was probably huge news on the South Shore. And in the summer, and the murder of the prostitute in 2008, well, not as big, but still a gruesome murder, right? So once again, he's getting attention. He's reminded of how powerful he is. 
big newsworthy crimes, crimes that he committed, and he's reading about them in the bathrobe, in his bathrobe with a cup of coffee, but his conscience is, was bothering him, she says, right, I point to her, so in 2009, he's struggling, he doesn't want to kill again, but he needs the adulation, the feeling of power, so what does he do? He reminds everyone of what he did in 2007. Exactly. He plants Didi's finger with the class ring, and voila, there were probably a ton of stories all over again. This time, assuming the Yale students are dead, how tragic, how horrible, how mystified the police are, and how powerful he is. How powerful and impressive he is. I sweep a hand. He gets the thrill of it without the bloodshed or the risk. That's fascinating, she says, leaning her head back on one hand. Leaning her head on one hand. How your mind works. I wave it off. I could be all wrong. Maybe not. Might not even be the same person. Her eyebrows rise slightly. Well, it makes sense to me, especially when you see what he did to Sally Feisfer in 2010. That is the end of this video. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.